And at that point in time, you can turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, we'll be picking up in verse 12. But let's ask the Lord to bless this time of Bible study. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, and we ask that you would just continue to open up our hearts and minds that we may build our lives upon you. And Lord, we know that in your word that you've provided it to us, that it may create that anchor, that it may create that from on which we build our life. And so, Lord, we thank you, and we praise you today as we turn to that which you have provided and that which you have prepared for our hearts and for our minds, for our hands and for our feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Paul, in true lawyer fashion, has been proving the case for justification by faith in Christ and Christ alone. He's talked about how our forgiveness of sin is based purely in the love of God, and this love of God leads then to peace with God. That the peace of God brings hope, a hope that does not disappoint, even in times of great tribulation. And more amazingly, God did this while we were all his enemy. And in verse 10 of the, the same chapter, it says, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. And so the Apostle Paul saying, by grace and by the grace of God, we have received reconciliation at the point in time that we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Now Paul knows that everything that he's gone through up to this point, the points that he's proven, the cases that he's made, are still going to raise objection. And one of the objections that is going to be raised is this whole issue of being forgiven of sin based on who is a sinner. And he's going to prove that, well, how many sinners do we have in the room? All of us, okay? And Paul's going to prove it. Look at what he says in verse 12 of chapter 5. Therefore, just as though or through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, thus death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, in true Pauline fashion, he goes all the way back to the beginning. The sin that is in the world entered the world at a single starting point. It entered with, well, I know some of you would like to think that it was the first woman, <laughs> but it was actually with the first man. Sin entered the world with Adam. And this is where a lot of people like to challenge. A lot of people struggle with this concept of sin being that which is imputed to us. And they say, okay, so what you're telling me is that because Adam sinned, that means that all men, including me, are born as sinners. And the simple answer to that is yes. That's exactly what it means. And this is when the arguments normally begin. The argument for the Jew of the day would have been that it's absurd to think that somehow or another that there was sin before the law because it was the law that brought about the comparison of God's perfect standard by which all sin was identified and judged. And thus, if there was no law at the time of Adam, how could there even have been sin at the time of Adam? And to this, Paul, he responds. Look at what he says in verse 13. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin was not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Now, what does that all mean? Paul says, okay, you're half right. Paul says, you're half right. You're right. The law is what identifies sin and what makes us guilty by virtue of us not being able to comply with the law. But that doesn't mean that sin was not in the world before the law. Sin was here. He says, look at the evidence of sin in the world. First off, the penalty of sin under the law is what? Death. Paul says, so the law identified that the penalty for sin, the wages of sin, is death. But the evidence also shows that death was also the penalty for sin before the law, because everything that lived died. When Adam sinned, the penalty was established for sin, and it brought death upon the world. You guys realize that man was designed by God to live forever. 
If Adam and Eve had not sinned, if there was no sin in the world, Adam and Eve would be here today, and I believe that they would be in this church because this would be the church they would come to. I'm convinced. If they lived in Dayton, they would come here. But we know that that's not the case. But from the time of Adam up to the time of Moses, when the law was given, everything that lived also died. And Paul says death proves that sin was present even before it was called sin by the law. And because all men die before the law came, it means that this original sin of Adam was passed on to every man in every generation. Paul's argument to the Jew is rock solid. They can't get around his logic and the fact that it proves death is the obvious identifier that sin is an ongoing reality. Oh, the Gentile, though, would have had a different argument. The Gentile would have seen it completely different. They'd have said, wait a minute, you've been told or told us that we have free will, that we can choose doing right or doing wrong. Then why is Adam's sin, what he did, why is that being held against me? How many of you have ever hated it in that situation where the whole group got punished because one person messed up? I hate that when that happens. All right? And the idea is, is that hopefully peer pressure is going to solve the problem later on. But I used to hate that idea that, oh, the whole group has to stay after because one person didn't turn their homework in or something. I mean, it's just not right. And so this would have been the argument of the Gentile. Shouldn't I be judged based on my own conduct? And if my conduct is not sinful, then should I not be declared sinless? And again, the answer is very simple. No. You're not sinless. Yeah, that's hard to do, isn't it? Everybody try that for one thing. Try to go, no. And yeah, you get hung up somewhere between here and Yeah. I love the fact that the answers are very simple. And in this case, there is no getting out of this aspect of being that which is brought to this place of having sin. The proof, once again, comes through the evidence of death. All those who have ever lived have also died. And thus, all of those who ever lived have sinned. Remember, God declared that there's not one righteous, no, not one. And guys, no matter how hard we try, no matter how you modify your behavior, no matter how you try to make it through the day and being sinless, it's in your DNA. It's how you were built. It's how you were, you were born. It, it came with you, and your best efforts are not going to allow you to be able to be sinless. But yet there are those that would argue this fact and say that basically what you do is always a product of where you've been and what you've been exposed to. The secular human, humanist likes to say that good and bad behavior is all based on circumstance. It's all based on conditions. According to man's view of good and evil, it all comes down to what a person is exposed to. It's not inherent. It's not a defect in, in the person. Everybody is basically good to begin with. How many of you know that? The problem's the environment. And if we can just control the environment, if we can make it free from everything that's bad, then everyone will be good. How's that working for us? But we see it in the end of everything that is out there. Every aspect of the spectrum, people try to blame everything but sin for the effects of sin. Oh, the problem is racism. If there wasn't racism, everybody would behave. Oh, if there was income equality. If everybody made the exact same amount of money, everybody would be good. Poverty, education, immigration, prison reform, lack of taxes being taken from the rich and distributed to the, the poor are the reasons that we have bad things happening in the world. And we all know this to be true, right? And on and on it goes as the world tries to fix a problem while refusing to acknowledge that the problem is sin. And while there's no doubt that these factors impact our culture, understand, they are not the cause of the problems. They're simply the symptoms, the result of the problem. The problem is sin, and until sin is addressed, all of these symptoms are going to not only continue, but they're going to advance. They're going to become more sophisticated, new and improved problems based on this, this inability or unwillingness to acknowledge that man's problem is, is that we were born with a sin nature. You don't have to teach people to sin. <laughs> you don't have to force it upon them through the environment. You can take two 
normal toddlers. You can take two fairly well-behaved toddlers. You could take even what we could refer to as good kids, toddlers. They're so innocent. They're so cute, aren't they? And you could stick them in a room together and you could provide them with all of the toys, with all of the snacks, with all of the caregivers, with all of the entertainment and all of the, the attraction and distraction that they would need to go all the way from being a toddler to a teenager. And somewhere in the middle of the church service, one of those toddlers will turn to the other toddler, see the toy that's in his hand and go, mine! And in work by whatever means necessary to extract that toy from that toddler, even by force if necessary. Now, I know when I talk like this, there's always those people that go, well, they're so sweet and children are a gift of God. Yes, they are. Bless their evil little souls. <laughs> they're born in sin. If you don't think so, there's something wrong with you. Now, we need to lead them away from those paths and lead them into the paths of righteousness so that they will come to know the Lord and walk in His ways. But the reality is, we don't have to teach them to be bad. And I'll have people come to me and say, I really don't appreciate you talking about my child that way. <laughs> my child isn't a sinner. And I'll say, you haven't brought it home from the hospital yet. Wait till you get home, wait a few months, and then come back and talk to me. You'll start seeing that nature. Now, I'm not, I'm not casting dispersion on children because we were all children once. But the reality is, is that we don't have to, this isn't a, an environmental issue, it's a heart issue. It's something that we are born, we are brought into, and we are, we are absolutely, each and every one of us, born into a sin nature. And the only thing that can remove it is Jesus Christ. And remember, just one generation, the first generation out of the perfection of the Garden of Eden that Cain killed his brother Abel. How much more closer to perfection can you get before we see this aspect of pride and jealousy raising up in the hearts and minds of people? And again, it doesn't matter how well we behaved. It doesn't matter. There's always going to be this sin nature that is a part of us. Now, if we flash forward. Have you ever encountered that adult that doesn't want to ad admit or have any acknowledgement of the fact that they're a sinner? I, I've talked to that person. Well, I don't understand. You know, you Christians, you're always running around tell people how bad they are. I'm a good person. I'm not a sinner. And of course, depending on what they're using as a standard of sin, <laughs> they may be right if they have no restrictions. But it's easy to take them to the place of saying, okay, let's talk about just a few good general principles. Let's talk about lying, and let's talk about stealing, and let's talk about, about wanting something that doesn't belong to you. And of course, we're not necessarily telling them that these are part of the commandments, the perfect and righteous standard of God. So I'll ask people, have you ever told a lie? And it normally doesn't get past that point. There's nobody in here that's not a liar. Yes, I just called you all liars. Those are fighting words, Pastor. No, they're not. It's just the truth. We've all, and, and, and you can frame it and you can say, well, yeah, but it was just a little white lie. Is there such a thing as a white lie? No, if it's a mistruth, if it's an untruth, if it's meant to deceive even for good things, it still hits the category of lie. And so when somebody's confronted with this, there's no means by which they can escape the fact that there is, is this sin that resides in their life. But I got a better proof than that. And rather than just sitting there and calling them a liar and a thief and going through the whole Ten Commandments and <laughs> convincing them that they're a sinner, I just ask them, are you going to live forever? Well, no. Well, the wages of sin, the effect of sin, what sin creates and brings about is death. So by the fact of your own admission that you know that you're going to die, then you've also declared that you are also then a sinner. And it's interesting because sin has got 100% or death has got 100% success rate in proving out the fact that there's sin in the world. And, and, and I'm going to rabbit trail here for a minute, but I'm going to do it on purpose. Normally I do it just because I'm absent-minded. But this is purposed. And I don't want you to in any way think that, that, I, that I'm doing something from a, from a place of being insensitive or in any way I, I don't want to be misunderstood. I want you to hear my heart. Death and the expectation of death provides one of the greatest opportunities for us to share the hope that does not disappoint with people in the world. 
It's one of the greatest times that we can do that. Often when we're, when we're faced with death, when somebody is faced with either their own death or the death of a loved one, they're willing to open up in a way that they've refused up to that point in time. And it provides them the opportunity after being confronted with death to listen about eternal life. During the years, I've been called on many, many occasions, and I, I, I do a, a large number of memorial and celebration of life services. On a, on a continual basis, there's probably not a month that goes by that there isn't at least one, if not more, not just for folks here in the body, but for the community as well. And it's one of the areas that I really believe that God has gifted me in because it's something that I enjoy. I absolutely enjoy <laughs> doing memorial services. Doesn't that sound weird? Wow, Pastor, you're, 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 that's, that's bizarre. No, because see, there's an opportunity there. See, weddings, I would rather do a, a celebration of life in a memorial service than a wedding. Weddings are all about the bride. How many of you know that? I mean, that's what it's all about. It's a bride's day. That's, it's all about the bride. All the attention, all the focus is on the bride. She gets everything. All the guy's got to do is show up and not pass out. I can't tell you how many guys have had stand up here and just kind of go. And I'll say, do you? And they go, uh. Say, I do. I do. I mean, it's, it's terrible. So it's about the bride. But a memorial service, when there's been a loss, when there's been something that, is, that has captured our hearts, allows us to pay attention in a way that maybe we never have before. And I will take advantage, listen, I will take advantage of the opportunity to be able to get into somebody's head and into their heart with the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the love that he has for them, and the fact that his hope doesn't disappoint by any means I can. And if that's the means by which they're open to receiving it, then I'm going to take opportunity and make that an opportunity to share. And there's those that have looked at me and said, wow, you would do that. What a terrible thing you would take advantage of. People. I'll take advantage of anything. If it means that I can bring them to the point of receiving and accepting and understanding the necessity of Jesus Christ in their life. We had somebody once complain, believe it or not, about all the food that we have here at Calvary Chapel. Anybody in here want to complain about what will be available for you between services? No, it's great, right? But they were saying, you know what? You guys just serve food so people will come to your church. I said, okay. I said, I, I don't care if that's what it takes to get people to the church. I'll stand in the middle of Highway 50 with a donut shooter, and I'll shoot cars as they go by. If they'll come to church, I'll do whatever it takes. Whatever I can do to get people in front of us to hear the Word of God, I'm going to do it in order for them to be able to receive. But guys, here's what I want to encourage you guys with. Here's what I want you to understand. It is inevitable. We are getting older. Should the Lord tarry, should we not hear in our physical life the words come up here and be raptured and be taken out as a, as a believer it, it, with the church as a whole, then we are going to pass through this process of physical death. It's going to happen. I used to thought, think that I was getting, you know that old saying, you're not getting older, you're getting better? Sometimes I just feel like I'm getting older. Now, I got to tell you what, I was very thrilled. Somebody in the first service spoke up when I said that and said, no, you're getting better, and my wife agreed. It's just because she knows how rotten I used to be. But we're all getting older. We're all going to be confronted with this process and with this aspect of physical death at some point in time in our lives. And here's the thing. If we have not taken the opportunity to share our faith with our loved ones, to ask them what their position is in accepting or denying Jesus Christ, to confront them with that, then we've not exercised our place of responsibility as a believer in loving them to the point of telling them the truth. And guys, I understand family dynamics, and I understand how it is sometimes that it's hard. I'll have people tell me all the time, well, it's just not like that in my family. We don't talk about things like that. I can't talk to my dad about that, about the Lord. I can't, my dad is so, you don't understand, my dad, he's like, can't get anything out of him. I can't talk to my mom about it. My mom's got a different belief system. I can't talk to my brother or my sister. Our, our relationship isn't that kind of thing. I don't want to offend them. I don't want to take and get to the place that somehow or another I'm not respecting their desire not to hear it. Guys, and that's a lie. And it's a lie that's promoted by the enemy because if you really truly love someone, you will tell them the truth and you'll find the opportunity, whatever it takes, to be able to minister the word of God to them and at least ask them, if not just once, to make sure that they've heard 
that there's a hope that doesn't disappoint. To make sure. One of the things that happens is so sad when I do a celebration, or, or a, and I'll even call this a funeral. And, and what's the difference between a celebration of life and a funeral is when the people come to me and say, we have no idea. They never expressed any type of interest in the, in, the, in the things of the Lord. They never expressed that they were a believer. They never really had, they weren't real, and normally it comes across, they weren't real religious. And it concerns me greatly because at that particular point in time, I really only have one focus, one thing that I'm looking at that is so important, and that is, is that the, the folks that would be in that situation would understand and come to know that there's a hope, that there's a Savior. But a lot of times people feel embarrassed. They can't speak, so they avoid the conversations. Family dynamics can make it hard. <sighs> Family dynamics put the fun back into dysfunctional. <laughs> and there are times when a family member will come to me, a, a, a sincere individual that tries so hard to win their family, say every time that we get together around a table, every time that we come together, there's a huge fight and a huge argument. I'm going to my, my folks' house for Thanksgiving dinner, man, and it's going to happen again because we're going to sit down at the table and I'm going to want to pray over the meal and it's going to be on, man. There you go again with your religious stuff. Why do you got to pray for the turkey? It's cooked. Eat it. And the fight's going to be on, and it breaks their heart because they want their loved ones to come to the Lord. And I'll, and I'll ask them, I'll say, well, have you told them? Well, yeah, that's the problem. Every time I go to the house, I tell them that they need to accept Jesus Christ, and we fight. I says, okay, so you've told them that they need Jesus Christ. You've told them that, that you've secured your salvation through him. You've told them that there's a hope. You, you, so they know. Well, yeah. I said, then stop telling them. What? Stop telling them and just start loving them. Just start loving them right where they are, right who they are. Because they've obviously heard for you to walk into the room every time you walk into the room and literally remind them that you have something that is against them, then they're not going to turn around and receive what it is that you're saying. So just go in and love them and blow their mind. It'll blow their mind. If they come in and they're expecting a fight and you just don't fight, if they get, if they get ready to sit down and, 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 and they look to you to see if you're going to pray, just reach out, grab that turkey leg and take a bite out of it. <laughs> Move on. And just love them. Well, what do I do if they're doing something wrong? What if I do if they're, if they're doing something sinful? Well, you do exactly what God did with us. But God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, guys, we don't have to agree with them. We don't have to support them in their sin. We don't have to encourage them in that. But we can love them right where they are regardless of who they are, because that's how God loved us. That while we were yet his enemies, while we were yet sinners, he sent his own son to die for us. A while back, and I get, I get a lot of strange mail and a lot of sometimes strange phone calls, but this rates right up there. One of these days I'm going to write a book and this gets a chapter. I got a phone call from a family member who introduced themselves and said, here's the thing. You need to tell them to back off. I went, okay, first off, hi. <laughs> who is this? And they explained who they were, and then they identified the person. They said, every single time this person comes to a family outing, they walk in and they stand in the middle of the room, living room, and they look at everybody in the room, and they say, you're all going to hell. And they yell that we're all a bunch of sinners, and we're all going to hell, and if we don't repent, that we're going to turn, or we don't turn, we're going to burn. If we don't flip, we're going to fry. They just go through the whole thing, and they read us the riot act, and it ends in a big, huge fight, and they storm out, and we storm out, and everybody's yelling at everybody, and everybody's mad at everybody. And I went, so you want me to tell them to stop? She goes, yeah! It's we're going to kill them if they don't stop. We're going to throw them out of the family. And after I continued to talk with this person for a while, what I realized is that they really loved this person and it wasn't about the what they were saying, it was about the how it was coming. It was about the how it was being presented. The passion that this person had in wanting to see their family brought to, to salvation had moved to the position of trying to warn them of the wrath that was to come but forgot to bring the love that it's attached to and the love that brings us out of the wrath of God and into the salvation and into the grace of God. 
Their intention was right. Their whole approach was wrong. And so we had a conversation. And did la at last I heard things are going very well because they're able to sit in the same room without wanting to kill each other, which is a great thing. But guys, understand, we need to be able to take and to respond and make sure that people know. And if this aspect of the end of times of knowing that everyone that has lived is going to die creates that opportunity, then use it and do so to the honor and the glory of the Lord. Amen? All right, back from the rabbit trail. Here we go. Paul has declared that all are sinners because of one man. And now he's going to identify how all can be made righteous through one man. He says, not only that, but <laughs> he's still in that, but wait, there's more mode. The gift of salvation is far better in value than the cost of the offense. Look at what it says in verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. The gift is greater than the offense. The offense created physical death. The gift provides eternal life. Oh, there's no comparison. If they were equal, and they're not, if they were equal, what the gift of Christ would have provided to us is simply immortality in this life. If it was equal, if sin equals death, and if sin was forgiven in an equal fashion, it would not have led to eternal life. We would just get immortality here on this planet. Isn't that a great and happy thought? Some people think so. Oh, it's in all the movies. People write about it. People want to, you know, the immortals, the idea of living forever through all of the generations, and all of them are just always real happy about it, aren't they? I wish I could die. You see, here's the thing. This gift is so much more superior because it doesn't offer us that which would allow us to stay here. It offers that which is so much better in relationship to the presence of God and in heaven. But man has been fighting this idea of, of death ever since the beginning. Man seeks immortality or to put off death as long as they can. And it's hilarious at some of the extents of what will go. Now, I think modern medical science and the ability to be able to help and to be able to sustain and to be able to have and, and live longer and healthier life, I think it's all great, don't I? And I think it's, it's more of a gift of God than people recognize. But there's some stuff that people do that's pretty stupid. And pretty crazy, all right? Have you ever seen one of these celebrities that gets stuff lifted and tucked so much that they don't even look like they did when they started out? <laughs> stuff is stretched so tight that their eyeballs are over here on the side of their head and their nose is up here, right? And their mouth is frozen in such a way that they can't, and it's like, yes, I'm doing this to be young and youthful again. It's like, stop it. <laughs> I've never seen any one of those work out to where it really makes a difference other than to give us something to look at and go, wow, <laughs> you don't look anything like. <laughs> the point is simple. For those who have no hope in a future, this is the only thing they have. The here and the now. And so this here and now they want to hold on to as long as they can. But because of the promise of eternity and the hope that we have in Jesus, guys, understand... I don't want to live forever on a fallen world. If immortality was offered in relationship to living in a sinful environment, I don't want to be here past the 60, 70, or 80 years that God says that we have. Not when I know that there's an eternity in the presence of God where things will be perfected, where things will be for all of time in the fashion and the manner of what Lord, the Lord Jesus has promised us. Guys, you realize that our lives on this earth are likened to that of steam leaving a boiling pot. We struggle, we fight, we scrap 60, 70, 80, 90 years on some cases. Boy, and there's some folks, when it gets to the point to where, to where it's, just, it's just amazing to think that people are like, wow, you're still alive. Now, I'm not begrudging it. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Live as long as God tells you to, and God will tell you exactly when your time is up, and that's when you go, because it's, it's up to him. Our days are measured. But the reality of it all is that, is that, is that, that there's, there's not this aspect of, of somehow or another that this is all there is. And so we need to wrap up everything that we are and try to make sure that we hang on to everything that we accomplish. Through sin, or through man, one, one man sin entered the world. But through the grace of God, another man, Jesus Christ, 
This problem of sin has been replaced by a far greater gift. Look at what it says in 16. And this gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from the offense resulted in condemnation. But the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. So why is the grace of God greater? Sin entered through one man, and it affected all men. But God's grace forgives all of man's sin. How amazing in that. God's gift of grace is great enough to cover all of our sin, past, present, and future. Christ's sacrifice once and for all is completed. And never again does there need to be a sacrifice for sin. And this would have blown the minds of the Jews because the Jews had to sacrifice continually because there was continual sin. And I believe that there's Christians that somehow or another think that we have to continually put Jesus on the cross because we continually sin rather than recognizing that once and for all, as our, we've placed our faith in him, that we have been justified. And it was just a few weeks ago that we went through this whole aspect of justification by faith. It means as I put my faith in Jesus, it's just as if I'd never sinned. And guys, we need to live in that reality. We need to be those that can take and, and recognize and realize that Jesus Christ has finished the work. And it means that we can truly live out our faith in such a way that we're victorious. I never want to sound heady or as if we have somehow arrived at perfection because we know better. But there are far too many Christians that walk around with their chin on the ground and their eyes turned down thinking that somehow or another they have no value or no worth. And we need to stop it because that's the presentation that very often the world is seeing. Very often we find ourselves being caught up in this aspect of thinking that somehow or another that we don't have the privilege and the position of being children of the King that God has granted us by faith in Jesus Christ. If you are now as one who has not sinned in the eyes of God, then why are you running around in, in a position of looking and feeling all the time as if somehow or another you still have to provide something? Guys, live in the victory. Live in the victory that's Jesus Christ. Because that's what's going to be demonstrated to the world. That's what the world is going to see when we are living victorious. Now, again, it's not because of us. It all is glory and honor to God. It's all that. It's based on Jesus Christ. But, guys, we need to start acting like Christians, like victors, not victims. We need to start demonstrating to the world around us that there's an opportunity for us to trust and stand on the promises of God, the righteousness of Christ that has been applied to our life, should bring us a confidence that allows us to be able to stand in the midst of any circumstance, in any condition. When the Apostle Paul declared in Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. He was speaking about the context of life. He was talking about the ups and the downs. He said, when I'm hungry, I can depend on him. When I've got too much to eat, I can depend. It doesn't matter what the circumstances of life are. I can do all things because I've learned to be at peace with God. The Lord wants us to have this kind of confidence. <laughs> and this means that we're free to enjoy life. This is another thing that I have a hard time seeing Christians do lately. We get beat up and we have a tendency to walk around as if we're always beat up. Guys, start enjoying life again, will you? There is so much joy in relationship to what God has given to us, what Jesus Christ has provided to us. Christ says, I want you to have life, and I want you to have it what? More abundantly. When I look at the abundant life of some Christian, I think that these Christians, it's like, well, the abundance that they're looking at are bills and problems and illnesses. No, that's not the abundant life that Christ was talking about. He was talking about for us to be able to enjoy the life that he's given us, enjoy the family, enjoy the relationship, enjoy our kids, enjoy the things that, that he provides to us in this world, the beauty of this world that he's provided. He's given us this opportunity in this place to be able to be those that are standing upon his promises regardless of what's going on in the world. And instead, there's so many of us that are so under the consequences of the world that we can't even have joy in the Lord. And that's not where he wants us to be. But it's not because of us just willing it, it's because he has promised it and because we find ourselves in him. So guys, here's the deal. It's been a tough couple of years, hasn't it? It's still kind of rough right now. I really wish God would have seen this coming and told us it was going to happen. 
But as believers, what's happening here and now shouldn't take away our joy in the Lord. We shouldn't be so concerned with what's happening here that we forget that what we're going to is so much better, that, that, that the offense is nothing compared to the gift. That what goes on in this world, we have an opportunity to be able to turn everything that's taking place that the world is seeing as being this this oppression into the freedom that comes through Christ Jesus if we will just share rather than joining into feeling as if we're oppressed. Guys, I'm not, I'm anything but oppressed. I'm impressed with Jesus Christ and I want to impress him on everybody that we can. And this is the attitude that God wants us to have at this particular point in time because we have more opportunity right now than we've ever had in our lives, at least my life. With the awareness that I have right now, think about it, in the last year and a half, let's talk about the crazy stuff that has happened just in this fellowship. First off, look at this room. How many of you remember when we were in the other room? If you were all here today, we would be sitting on each other's laps. In the middle of a global pandemic, the Lord provided everything that we needed to be able to expand His house in order to do the work that He's called us to do in this community. Fifty-plus kids coming to Awanas on Wednesday night. Twenty to thirty youth, yeah, coming, coming in to hear the Word of God. We're getting ready to do a trunk or treat. Be praying for that all week. I want to see 200 kids come through the trunk or treat, dragging their parents even if they don't want to be here because they're all going to hear about Jesus Christ. Whatever it takes. And if i got to bribe a bunch of kids with candy, we will bribe kids with candy. (laughs) We'll even bribe the parents. The snicker goes a long way. (laughs) Look at the opportunity that God's giving us. just, Just look around. And yet sometimes we we walk out of this place and we we see this and we recognize it and we realize it, but we don't take that out to the world. We don't take that out and we don't share that. It doesn't translate coming through in our heart and our personality. When we look at somebody else, we walk into the office tomorrow morning, it's like, oh, yeah, good job, messed up. Yeah, I know. What'd you do yesterday? I went to church. (laughs) What? No, I know your life is all messed up, and mine would be too, except I got a promise that the gift is better than the offense. And share that with somebody in love and share it with them in such a way that they see the joy of the Lord that's been in your heart and causing them to want it as well. Amen? For by one man's offense, death reigned through one. Much more, those who receive abundance of grace and of the grace of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. You see, the righteousness of Christ will reign in our life through grace abundantly. And when we see what Jesus Christ has offered, it's it's amazing. When we see this freedom, when we see this liberty, when we see this hope that doesn't disappoint, it's amazing how anyone can look at this and say, I don't want it. But there's so many in the world that have said that they they don't want to have anything to do with Jesus Christ, and you've got to wonder why. And I think part of the reason is is that they don't realize the reality of death. You've got a lot of people out there that want to say, this is it, you live, you die, and then it's all over. And because of that, it really doesn't matter. And if you can convince yourself that that's the case, if you have convinced yourself that there is nothing beyond this life, then you will not live a life that has any accountability to anyone or anything other than satisfying your own needs. And that's where folks are living right now. And it's a false hope. It's a false hope that is based in this idea of somehow or another that it's not going to come true. That there isn't anything on the other side. They're hoping that there's nothing that will be affected by their actions here on the other side. And man, they are in for a rude awakening. There's another group that's in for a rude awakening. I call those the heaven hopers. It's those that are just hoping to get to heaven through a participation award. I'm a human being and I'm on the earth and so therefore God should love me and let me into heaven. (laughs) And I go, no. It's not how any of this works. There is no ability for us to get into heaven just simply because we are. And yes, everyone is going to live forever, but we're going to live forever in one of two situations. One where God is our Father, and the other where God has been our judge. Years ago, I had a conversation (laughs) with a co-worker, and he told me that he was a Unitarian. Have you ever heard of a Unitarian? Okay. 
I had to ask him what this meant because at the time I was not necessarily real familiar. So he started explaining that in his understanding, a Unitarian was one who, who basically embraces all things. They don't have any opinion as to one way or the other. They don't agree or disagree with anyone's religion. As a matter of fact, they want to be free to think anything they want about anything they want at any time that they want, and so therefore they just don't have a position on anything. And so I asked him, I said, you know, what was, <laughs> so that just sounds to me it's more like somebody that just doesn't care about anything or anybody. Is that what you're talking about? Well, no, that isn't what it means. It just means that I don't pick sides. I said, oh, okay, you don't pick sides. I said, well, why not? I mean, when, when it comes to this whole idea of death and something on the other side, why don't you pick sides? Because I really don't think it matters because I really don't think that there's anything there. And then he said something very interesting. He followed up and he says, but if there is, I would probably care. I was confused on his behalf <laughs> and his own belief system, but I stayed with him for a while. He knew I was a Christian. He knew I was a pastor, so he was re waiting for me to come back with some religious retort, and instead I just asked him a simple question. I said, let me ask you a question. What if you're wrong? What if you're wrong? What if this idea about there being nothing after this life is wrong? And you really need to have an opinion. He said, well, in that case, if there is something afterwards, I would hope that it's better than anything that I've experienced here, and I would just hope that to be the case. And I said, well, here's the problem. I said, what if it wasn't better? I said, what if what's on the other side was terrible? What if it was so horrific that it made your best day on this planet look like paradise in comparison to what happens after this life? What would you think about that? He goes, well, that would be bad. I said, well, we're getting somewhere. Now you're finally starting to realize that it would be bad. And he agreed, and he said, he said but, but, but here's the thing. I don't know if I believe that or not. I said, I, I can appreciate that. You don't want to believe it. I said, but what if, on the chance that there is something after this life, you could ensure that whatever it was would be the best thing beyond your wildest imagination. Would you choose that? He says, I was expecting you to do this. <laughs> You're trying to sell me on your God's heaven, right? And I went, no. I can't sell you God's heaven. It can only be received for free. But that's not what I said. I asked you a question. I said, let's get back to the question. What if you're wrong? What if your position is wrong. And let's look at it logically. I said, if you are right, and there is nothing on the other side, we live and we die and that's the end, what do I lose by having faith in Jesus Christ? If you're right and there is nothing afterwards, what do I lose by placing my trust in God and, a, and, a, and His Word and what I believe to be His Spirit dwelling within me, promising me eternal life through the sacrifice of a Lord and Savior who died because of you. What do I lose if you're right? I said, I live my life by a precept. I live my life by, by what I believe to be that which God it, it would have me to do and what honors Him and, and would treat people fairly and treat people with love. you, you got to understand, my religion doesn't call me to hate anyone. It calls me to love everybody. It calls me to be a good steward. It calls me to be responsible. It calls me to, to, to do that which is proper and right in the eyes of a God that has a higher standard than I do. So tell me, if I live my life that way and I die and I turn to dust and there's nothing else, what did I lose? He goes, nothing. Oh. Now let me ask you a question. If you're wrong, and there is a choice that has to be made, and there is an eternity that is going to be had between heaven and between hell, and there is a God that loves you and made a path and made a way for you to be able to receive that, but it's your choice to do so, and you don't choose it, 
what do you lose? What do you lose? He says, I don't want to talk about this anymore. I said, you just answered the question, didn't you? I said, for all of your hoping that there's nothing, your path and that hope causes you, if you're wrong, to lose everything. The path that I'm on, if I'm wrong, I lose nothing. But if I'm right, and if I place my trust in what God has said is the means of salvation that leads to eternal life, I gain everything and you lose it all. Which one do you want to be? I prayed for him as he walked away. Haven't seen him since. My prayer is that the seeds took root. This is therefore in verse 18. As through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through one man's righteous act. And the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Paul now starts bringing this whole point to a conclusion. He says, yeah, through one man all were condemned, and yet by one man, Jesus Christ, all of that as a free gift is forgiven and justification is granted. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The law was made so that it would identify the offense. Identify that we can't keep it. Identify our guilt. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But where there is sin, I love this, where there is sin, grace abounds more. And we look at the world right now and we think, man, this place is just run over with sin. There's so much sin everywhere you look. Everything's bad. Everything's wrong. Everything's, there's more grace. There's more grace. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. The gift is better than the offense, of more value than the offense. There is nothing that's going to happen on this planet, on this, on this world, that is going to outweigh the grace of God that leads us to salvation through Jesus Christ when we place our faith in it. Nothing can beat us. Guys, nothing outweighs it. Everything's an opportunity. Everything's the means by which we would have the opportunity to talk to somebody. When I see somebody that's desperate and just tore up and just totally bent out of shape because they're so worried and they got all of this anxiety, I just look at that and I go, I got a hope for you. I have a hope that comes from a place that is not dependent upon anything that I do or you do or anybody does. It doesn't depend on the government. It doesn't depend on, on the state. It doesn't depend on any actions. I have a hope that comes that's made available to everyone through Christ Jesus and God's grace that's available to anybody that will receive it. Guys, we need to be on fire about this time. We need to be in this place of just knowing and recognizing that God is granting us the ability to be able to do something in this generation that is, that is over the top. Isn't it going to be so neat when we find up in heaven and we look around and we see people coming up and going, man, I'm so glad you told me about Jesus. I'm so glad that you told me about him. I'm glad that you brought me to church. I'm glad that I went to that trunk or treat. I'm glad that you were there and you took the time to talk to me. I'm glad, as, as, as Pastor Gill was saying up here, he says, we want people to come through this parking lot and go, wow, there's love in this place. Do you know how much love is missing out of the world right now? And yet we serve a God that wrote the book on it <laughs> and are able to display it in all kinds of ways, as we will. We can live confident in the promises of our salvation and an abundant life through Christ, knowing that where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. And Lord, as we come to this place, may it be that the words that are spoken here, although meant to convince a particular target audience, oh, we know that the Apostle Paul 
was arguing from the, the Jews' perspective of the law being that which justified. And yet, Lord, we see so clearly that there's no way that the law can do anything other than point to the fact that we're sinners in need of Your grace. And then the Apostle talking to the Gentile, speaking about the, the, the aspect of how this freedom is not unbridled. That there is a framework that is in place that all have sinned. We're born with a sin nature. The very first one that was placed upon this earth chose, as we all would, to be disobedient. And thus, all since that time have been under that same condition of sin. But as sin entered through one, salvation came through another. Salvation came through your Son, Jesus Christ, that as we place our faith in Him, what we receive is better, as the gift is far better than the offense. Knowing, Lord, that in this strength and in this promise that we have opportunity. And so, Lord, as we come to this place today, I want to make one last offer for anybody that's in this room that has yet to receive salvation. I want you to know there's not anything that you're ever going to do that's going to accomplish anything that's going to impress God. There's nothing that you're going to do that's going to cause you to be able to find yourself in that place of being justified before the righteous standards of a God that has been given to us in order to demonstrate our need of a Savior. But here's what I want you to know. <laughs> it's the grace of God by which we're saved. It's the grace of God by which redemption and justification comes. And if you choose to impart in that grace, then it's given to you freely. But you have to be willing to accept it. You have to be willing to take it. And if you're here today and you haven't, I want you to know there's no hope for you. There's no hope. There's nothing that you can hope. Hoping that there's nothing that you're going to be accountable for doesn't work because we all know that we're going to be accountable. God has told us that it's appointed once for man to die, and after that then comes judgment. So if that's you today, as the music plays, we close this service down, there's going to be folks on either side of the sanctuary. They want to pray with you. They want to encourage you. They want to be there and have you take that time to say, Lord, I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want to give myself to you. I want to receive the grace and the mercy that you've promised. And Lord, I want to do so making Jesus Christ the Lord of my life. You don't have to have any other answer than to respond by belief and faith in Jesus Christ to start living an abundant life now, strength for today, for tomorrow, and life for all of eternity. In the Lord, in his blessings. Without it, no hope. The choice is yours. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you today. And Lord, we ask that you would take and allow this to just echo in our hearts and in our minds, and that, Lord, that it would bring us to the place of seeking out opportunity to share you with the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.